ahead, Matt. All right, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Buckley, and thanks everybody for joining us um, at noon your time, 11 o'clock central here. We have a very full 45 minutes planned for you today. Uh, as, as Matt said, we've been covering a lot of topics related to laboratory exhaust. So earlier in the week, I talked a lot about the products and the nozzles. And from a, a fan perspective, we're talking about the equipment up on top of the roof deck. And with the Antec controls, with the valves, pressurization, all of these pieces of equipment and controls need to work in harmony to ensure that your lab is operating correctly. So specifically today, what I'd like to get into is uh, talk about redundancy. You know, how do we ensure that this system stays up and running? And we'll talk about sequence of operations to make that happen as well. So a little bit about myself. I am a segment manager at Greenec. I've been here since 1994, involved with anything from commercial bathroom fans to power roof ventilators to industrial fans. In the last 10 years, I've really focused in on laboratory exhaust systems. Neat, interesting market, a lot of interesting applications, and to spend a lot of time with ASHRAE, I2SL, so on and so forth, just trying to keep keep in contact with all the changes in this great market. My background is a mechanical engineer from the University of Wisconsin, and I have a master's of business from University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. So a big Badger fan, Packer fan. So with that, we'll kick it off. My learning objectives are pretty straightforward. We will start with just a basic review of variable error volume labs and how they operate. So we'll set the stage because it, then it makes it a lot easier to understand you know, why redundancy is important and how these sequences of operation all fit in. A few fundamentals on the products, things you need to know if you weren't with us on Wednesday. First is that there, we have ANSI Z95 and NFP, NFPA45, which dictate a lot about the shape and look of these products for laboratory exhaust systems. So you see this gentleman standing on top of a concrete pad with a lab system in front of him and, in, and behind him. So NFPA 45 talks about the height from, from the concrete pad to the top of that stack and that discharge needs to be 10 feet, three meters. And that just keeps people from reaching into the airstream and getting, getting into these potential contaminants on him or her. Plus it gives us a stack to get that effluent up and away from the building. ANSI Z95 talks about the velocity. So you'll notice on both of these systems, we have a conical discharge nozzle decreasing the area with the intent to get that velocity to 3000 feet per minute or more. So that combination of velocity, stack height, helps us get that effluent up, on, up and away from the facility. And that's really what it's all about. We wanna make sure that in our facility, we have clean air for researchers or if there's processes, if you, me, or others are on top of that facility, we, we don't obviously want to come in contact with contaminants. And then many of the lab projects you're working on are in more congested areas. We want to be good neighbors as well. So keeping that safe zone is really important. And a lot of this really comes down to mass flow. How much air can we get out of the top of that nozzle? You know, keeping in mind sound criteria that you might have on your boundary lines um, and horsepower because you can crank up velocity to excessive levels, but you know there's there's some le there's some optimum level of nozzle velocity that gives us the best plume without ridiculous cost to operate as well. So factors are nozzle velocity, the diameter, and that's really gets us into that mass flow momentum to get that effluent up and away from the facility. We also have wind speed direction, terrain. So what's around our building? Other buildings, or is it just flat, nothing in the way? The percent contaminant in locations of downwind air intakes, other buildings, you know, whatever might else be around our particular facility. So we'll talk about more of this as we go through the presentation. But first, what I'm going to do is jump us into our virtual lab. And if you joined us on Wednesday, we talked about this variable air volume lab that has th uh, three variable air volume chemical or three variable chemical fume hoods. A variable flow, there's no bypass on these. We have a storage cabinet, snorkel, all of this exhaust air with these red arrows are combined into one manifold and duct system and being exhausted up and above the facility with this tubular inline fan. Then over on the right, I have my blue arrows, which is the makeup air into the space. So in the Antec discussions, 
talking about room pressurization. Ultimately, more red arrows exhausting than blue arrows coming in to ensure that we have a negative pressure inside of that space. We also talked about the velocity through the sash opening and how that's tuned in to the valves above each of the chemical fume hoods. Where we want to spend a little bit more time today, though, is this little green light that turns red whenever I make a change inside of the laboratory space. We want to understand how that pressurization works and, and how we can control that. So uh, the most common fundamental approach is simply using a bypass air plenum, which is this box underneath the fan, and this bypass damper. And this bypass damper is tuned in through the building management system or just a simple control to understand what is our duct static pressure set point. And it allows us to bring it in outside air to ensure that our duct pressure is consistent. So when I close a sash, my green light turns red, which is saying I have a fan on top of this system pulling air out of that space. There is literally less air available because I'm closing a sash or if I close a second sash. We need to have a means to accommodate for that change in flow without just letting this fan run crazy and cause an implosion in the ductwork with too much static pressure. So the most fundamental tool used is a bypass air plenum with a bypass air damper. And this damper modulates open and closed to bring in the amount of air that's not coming in from our hood anymore. And that's just outside air up on top of the roof deck. So here's one hood's worth of exhaust we're bringing on above the roof, a second, and then a third. So that is the fundamental approach that I see on these variable air volume labs to control and monitor pressure. When I open the sashes, now I need more containment at the hood level, so I need to make sure I have enough duct pressure. We'll start to close that modulating damper down until I'm back up to 100% utilization of the hoods inside of the space. Now, a lot of controls, a lot of moving parts, and we'll talk more about the sequence of operation and how to make that all happen. Ultimately, it's all about life safety, but we want the benefits of energy as well. So when you look at a system like this, and, and let's kind of study the blue arrows, when researchers close their sash on nights and weekends, which allows less air out of the space, what we're able to do then is limit the amount of air coming into the space. So not only is it safe, but we're reducing the amount of air that has to be humidified or cool, depending on your type of season. And when these sashes are closed, the overall energy consumption of that lab decreases as well. And that's a good thing. Be safe, be good to the environment and keep the operating costs under control as well. Now, what we've been focusing on pretty predominantly in this case is a single fan system. But the reality is more times than not, we're going to have some level of redundancy. So what I'm showing here is what's called N plus one redundancy. So if we have a vivarium, or for that matter, any type of critical application where I always need to ensure I have proper negative duct static pressure for containment. I have fan one in this case operating. Fan two is standby, adjacent. It's all tied into the same manifolded system. I have a bypass plenum that's housing both of these fans, so the fans are on top of that bypass plenum. And I have a bypass air damper that's feeding this common plenum, just like we would with an individual fan system. So when my sashes are open and I need more containment, that damper closes. As I start to close sashes, that damper again is going to modulate, and it'll feed either of these fans with outside air to make up for what's not happening in the system with the ultimate goal of maintaining duct static pressure. So in normal operation, fan one is running. If I go to an emergency mode for service or physically fan number one goes down, our control system might sense amps or flow through fan number one and realize something isn't correct. That fan will ramp down, its isolation damper will close and immediately fan two will kick on and its individual isolation damper will open up so that we maintain negative static pressure in that duct system. So from uh, the, the perspective of anybody inside of this facility, nothing's changed, everything's working the same. We've literally just jumped across to fan number two to ensure that everything is up and operational. When fan one is back up, we go back to our normal operation and we can uh, work back and forth as needed. Now, I talked about an emergency situation going from fan one to two. 
but with a two-fan system or a three-fan system like I'm showing, we would need to consider equal runtime for all of those products. So a common approach is every you know, Sunday night, we'll flip from fan one and then we'll let fan two run. Then the next Sunday, we'll go back to fan one because ultimately in this type of situation, you want equal runtime for all of these products on top of the building. The worst thing for any mechanical product is to sit there for a year and then if we go into emergency mode, who knows, maybe the bearings are bad, the belts are bad, and we don't have that backup as needed. So we definitely want to cycle these fans on and off for equal usage, and then you know everything is working appropriately. N, N plus one is by far the most common that I see out in the market. But what I want to do is introduce you to an alternative that we're seeing more and more, which is called N minus one. So N minus one in a normal mode has both fans running. So in this case, if you're looking over at the statistics on the left, I have, a, I have basically a lab volume of 12,000 CFM. So what I would do is have two fans running at 6,000 CFM. And if we go to an emergency mode, the remaining fan, it can actually increase its speed to get back up to our 12,000 CFM. So Ultimately, you have two fans in operation and everything else on top of the roof deck for this system is, is able to ensure the system operates if one of your products goes down. So this concept is very, um, very highly used, for example, in supply side air handling systems. You know, I mentioned I've been in the industry 25 plus years and you know, way back then you would have one big plenum in a box or maybe two that are pulling air through your, your filters and coils to, to heat or cool your building. You know, 20 years later, what's happening is we have these little plenum fan arrays. Instead of two fans, you might have 12 little plenum fans making a fan array wall. And if fan number 12 goes down, the other 11 fans ramp up with a variable frequency drive to cover the capacity of that one product that needs to be maintained. No difference in terms of a lab system. Now, a little rare to see two fans. It's more likely you'll see three or four fans. So that incremental change, if you know, in this case, if one fan goes down, the remaining fan has to double its capacity to ensure that your lab is working. Of course, if you have three fans, it's a little bit different. You're only going up 50% with the remaining fans, which is uh, much easier to attain. A two fan N minus one becomes a little trickier. You just have to be more selective on your approach to pick the fans. So let's get us back out to our presentation and we'll talk a little bit more about this redundancy. You know, ultimately it comes down to ensuring that our system is up and operational in an emergency case. Hopefully that never happens, but it's mechanical equipment, sometimes that can happen. So N plus one or N minus one are, are our approaches. N being the number of fans running, N plus one means that we have a standby, an adjacent fan that's just sitting there. N minus one saying that we're sizing our system for surplus capacity. So all of the fans run. If one goes down, the other fans can handle the load. A little more detail graphically of what we're talking about here. Again, I have a simple 12,000 CFM, three fans running in an N plus one. Couple important things to, 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 to wrap your mind around here. When fan number three is sitting idle, extremely important that our sequence of operation ensures this damper is closed tightly and that we're using an industrial quality damper. The last thing we need is a leaky isolation damper under the fan that allows the air go backwards through the standby fan and just simply short circuit our system. So instead of 12,000 CFM coming from the lab, I'm only getting 10,000 from a lab and 2,000 is, is bypassing the system. Bad stuff, it won't allow your system to work appropriately. And then when we go to our failure mode or maintenance mode, the operation of fan one and two goes, in this case, the fan uh, one and three. And then next week we could do fans two and three and then cycle our way back around to fan one and two. Extremely important that we get equal runtime on all of these products throughout the year. So that adds a little bit to the intensity of your sequence of operation, that ability to sequence between fans and shut them on and off for this league leg and equal runtime throughout the year. And minus one, again, very straightforward. 
12,000 CFM total from the lab. In this case, I have three fans now running at 4,000 CFM. It's a well-balanced system. Works out very, very well. Um, there's no lead leg that you have to worry about. You literally, all the fans come up, they're at the same frequency, they're pulling air. You can do bypass just like we talked about in terms of the virtual lab. No problem going that route. And then obviously if a fan goes down, two of the 4,000 CFM fans will crank up in our case to 6,000 CFM to handle the capacity of the system. Again, extremely important that we have industrial duty dampers on the isolation for the fan that's shut down to prevent any leakage and ensure we aren't just short circuiting our lab by bringing air through that standby fan. So I put a couple scenarios together, just food for thought to compare tubular inlines with high plumes as well as industrial blower with the high plume nozzle. So the high plume nozzles as I'm showing here on the right, no, no dilution, no entrainment. It's a one for one relationship with whatever comes out of the fan that's exhausting out of the top of the stack. So again, 12,000 at an inch and a half, relatively low pressure. And what we see in this particular diagram is two different selections of a tubular fan with that high plume nozzle. First, I did N plus one on the left half, and then I did N minus one on the right half. And as you look at these, you start to see some trends of where N minus one has its advantages. On the N plus one, I went with a two fan pack with 20 size 24s and a nozzle that gives me an outlet velocity of about, you know, just under 4,000. So I'm at 3,800 feet per minute. Brake horsepower for this fan. So I have, in this case, each fan is doing 12,000 CFM, one on and one off. 9.2 brake, which is a 10 horsepower motor. 83 decibels on the outlet. The footprint is 68 and a half square feet. Now, when you go, your N plus one, fan number two is doing the exact same thing. So when I go to an emergency mode, you're not going to see anything drastically different because it's literally a mirror image fan that's going to fire up and ensure that you have the appropriate duct static pressure and flow. Now let's go over to our N minus one. What I was able to do here now is I went to three smaller fans, size 18, which is a little bit smaller body, and then I can get away with a little bit tighter nozzle as well to maintain that 4,000 feet per minute. In fact, I'm a little high, 4,300 feet per minute coming out of the out, out of the nozzle itself. Brake horsepower is interesting, 3.02 per fan, total of 9.06. So actually, in this case, it reduces the cost of operation, and I see that pretty often. Going to more fans in many cases will drop the cost of operation, just you have more efficient fan selections. Sound, this is a big change. We went from 83 before to 71, significant, you know, 12, 13 decibels, that, that's a big change. Um, now, we have three fans though, so we have to do the logarithmic rhythmic math and that puts me up to 76 overall, which is still, you know, seven decibels less than our 80, 83 we had with a N plus one. In terms of footprint, this particular setup is about 18% bigger. So I'm 81 square feet versus the 68 and a half. Now in emergency mode, which is, it should be very rare. I'm going from a nozzle velocity of a little over 4,000 now to a little over 6,000, which makes sense. Our capacity has to go up 50% on the two remaining fans. Total brake horsepower went from three per fan to seven because we're basically doubling the capacity or adding 50% of the capacity to the fan to maintain our 12,000 CFM overall. Sound definitely goes up from 71 to 78. Now in this case though, I'm only adding two fans logarithmically, which puts me at 81 total. So a few things that you see out of this. Generally what I find is that going to more fans helps the overall efficiency. It also helps the overall sound, which can be very important for you if you have boundary line conditions. I mean, losing six or seven decibels might eliminate the need for an inline silencer or an outlet silencer, or it may prevent you from needing a screen wall, which can be extremely expensive as well. The downside is that you're gonna have more footprint, potentially a little bit more cost. So if you have, I don't know, let's say you have three VFDs versus two, two VFDs, there's certainly a little bit more capital expenditure up front. But if you have an owner that's in it for the long haul and this energy savings over the long haul pays for that additional capital very quickly, it's a good solution. If you have a developer that's just putting up a building to flip it, they're probably not gonna be interested in more upfront capital expense.
So you have to pick the approach that best suits the client that's going to be utilizing that lab. Now, here's a quick view of the footprint. Nothing too exciting here. You just see that going from two fans to three, the three fans is actually narrower but longer than what the two fan pack is. But you, don't, you still get the benefit of the tubular inlines, a very small footprint, um, which again, with a roof with a lot of congestion, this is really a good slick way to go. Now, I did the same thing. I'm not gonna go through the total gore uh, on the blower, but you, you're gonna see a lot of the same um, types of results. I was able to go to two fans on a 24 with a blower style, and I compared that to three size 18 fans with the blower style as well. So outlet velocity is very consistent, 4,100 to 4,300 when you're comparing normal operation. Total brake horsepower of my N plus one, that's 12,000 CFM per fan, just about eight brake horsepower. So I need a 10 horsepower motor. Uh, when I go to three fans running, you're very consistent, you know, 8.3 brake horsepower. I probably could have picked this one a little better to be a little more efficient overall. Sound, again, you're seeing when I go to the N minus one, 72 versus 81, again, significant. When you do your math to add those three fans together, I'm up to 77. Again, four to five decibels is audible, and it might replace the need for a screen wall or a silencer on your fans. And then, as is the case when, with the tubular fans, as you go to emergency mode from N minus one, now we're merging 4,000 CFM to 6,000 per fan, so obviously velocity goes up, brake horsepower goes up as well. Now, the downfall I always say with the blower style is footprint. So for this first selection, uh, 139 square feet, it's two times the footprint of the N plus one tubular. So it, it takes up more real estate. You know, that's a that's a disadvantage. Um, access is better though, and, which, and generally you find the efficiency is just a little better as well. If I go to N minus one, I'm up to 192, which is about a 40% increase in the overall footprint. So maybe a little difficult to see, but I have some overhead shots of what these systems would look like in terms of that footprint. They do take up quite a bit more real estate than simply an inline tubular fan that's mounted on a curb. Again, they both have their pros and cons, but both are very good solutions you know, for your critical lab applications. Quick summary, N plus one, as I said, very common. So that sequence of operation is out there. Most controls contractors probably can do this in their sleep. Simple to design, we know what it is, it's been around. Disadvantages, you do need that lead leg. So you wanna make sure you have equal runtime on all the products. And as I showed you, generally you find the N plus one is louder in, over, in overall terms of operation versus the N minus one. Again, depending on where you're, the location of your facility, that, that could be a huge reason to jump across to the N minus one type of operation. Uh, advantages of N minus one, eliminating lead leg as we talked about because all fans are running, quieter operation, smaller fans, but there are more small fans that can take up more footprint and that can be a cost disadvantage. So we do need larger horsepowers generally on N minus one, especially you know, if you're going from two fans down to one, there's a big uptick in the amount of horsepower required that a fan can double its capacity and keep the system up and operational. Um, it can be louder uh, when you're in maintenance or fail mode. And as I'd mentioned, it can be a larger system as well. And you just have to uh, take that into account when you're laying this out on your particular facility. Enough on redundancy. Let's start talking a little bit about the sequence of operation. So we're measuring and managing duct static pressure. This goes back to that red and green light we were looking back on the virtual lab, which is telling us, you know, everything's great inside of our duct system or if we're in trouble, too much pressure, not enough pressure for appropriate containment. So a common question I get is, you know, where in the heck do you measure the static pressure on this system to ensure that everything is working appropriately? And much like many things with lab systems, there's no silver bullet answer. But a few of the things that I see that work pretty well, I'll, I'll start with the middle one. The general practice, you know, if you, if you look at ASHRAE or I2SL or you sit into a lot of presentations on all of this, generally what you hear is three quarters of the way down the main trunk of your lab. Now, clearly what I have is a pretty simple little system here. I only have three fume hoods and there's a little riser, but if this was, you know, 50 or 100 and we have a huge riser going down, you don't want to be down to the near bottom of that riser, you know, three quarters of the way down or more. Um, and that set point pressure is going to be less than what you're going to collect if you were right up by the inlet of the fan, okay? 
So that's a common question I get as well, is, well, why don't we just put the static pressure uh, sensor right in the bypass plenum? And you can certainly do that. Um, you know, sometimes what I see on sequence of controls is we put a pressure sensor three quarters of the way down, and we're also managing or monitoring pressure inside of the plenum, just kind of as emergency to make sure nothing odd is going up wrong in that plenum. The one challenge with the plenum is if you do have a lot of bypass air coming in or ducts from different orientations, that can be kind of a turbulent area and you can get some oddball results if you're measuring the pressure there. You just need to be aware of it. Now, when it really all comes down to, uh, you might put this three quarters of the way down and find that your system doesn't work. You're like, well, Matt, what are you talking about? What it really comes down to is you have to know what your furthest valve is from the exhaust source, in this case, the fan, and make sure that that valve has appropriate pressure drop. So if, you, if that furthest valve is in good shape, you know, I guess you can take a step back and say, theoretically, all my other valves are going to be in good shape as well. So making sure that first, furthest one is good and having a pressure reading at that point, if necessary, you know, will feed back into the whole premise that the rest of my system is gonna be operating correctly. The sequence of operations. This is a quick diagram if this, you know, photo-based or, or diagram-based helps you understand a little bit more, but we have duct static pressure kind of as, you know, what, what we're measure, measuring and monitoring. And over on the right, I have a snippet of our virtual lab, a situation where the sashes are closed or being closed. Um, so there's obviously a change in the system. So we're not all, not everything's not balanced. I've circled the situation now where you close the sashes, the fan is operating, but the pressure is getting above the set point. So our priority in this particular case, as long as you have available velocity, you can first deal with the fan speed. So we can simply turn the fan down with a variable frequency drive. If, 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 you, if your nozzle velocity is such that you have a little room below to accommodate that, and we'll talk about the cautionary tales here as well. There's gonna be some point though where you can't slow this fan down anymore because of velocity concerns. And then at that point, you can crack the damper open to bleed in more outside air to ensure my pressure is correct. The opposite occurs then when the sashes are open, as you see here on the right, sash is open. Now our duct static pressure is below the set point we need. So our first transaction will be, let's start closing these bypass dampers to make sure we're taking air from inside of the space versus from the roof deck. And when we close that damper, and if we happen to be in a situation that's using fan speed as well, we're probably gonna find we're still need a little bit more negative pressure so we can ramp that fan up with the RPM and the variable frequency drive to ensure that we're attaining the appropriate duct static pressure. So it's as simple and as complicated as that um, to make this all work the way we want to on these variable volume systems. So some cautions. I, I've already alluded to this. Um, I, I have seen labs that do not use bypass, bypass dampers and they literally control everything with a variable frequency drive. And there's really no, there's no law or rule saying you can't do that. What you just have to main, ensure is that if this fan is increasing or decreasing speed and decreasing is more of concern to, to, to deal with changes in ver of flow inside, when I slow that fan down, keep in mind, it's directly proportional to the nozzle velocity, which as if you're using the Briggs equation is proportional to how high that stack is. So less mass flow, less plume. We don't want this settling down and you know settling on our roof for getting into air intakes just because we want to save energy on the system. So avoid that problem. The other thing that's important to note is how these variable air volume uh, systems that are monitoring constant pressure, you know, how does that impact how we move on our fan curve? This is a little bit trickier. You know, this is, I'm just showing a traditional fan curve, CFM across the bottom, static pressure in the y-axis. This red 1564 is just a random curve I picked. My operating point is around 9,000 CFM at roughly three and three quarters inches of water gauge. In a normal system with a variable frequency drive, if I go from 60 Hertz to 30 Hertz, I'm simply gonna ride down this system curve and you're gonna follow the fan loss. So if I go from 9,000 to, you know, roughly, 4,500, cut it in half. That would be going from 60 hertz to 30 hertz. My pressure is going to be about a quarter of where I started. 
the RPM is going to be about half of where I started. Pretty straightforward. But that's not reality with these systems that have changes, like valves that are closing, hoods that open and close, and all that interaction as we talked about on our virtual lab. The reality is you follow a line of constant static pressure. So instead of moving up and down the blue line, we're moving horizontally across our, you know, in this case, trying to hold three and three quarters of inches of static pressure uh, at our set point or at the fan level in this particular case. Now, let's look at it in terms of multiple family of fan curves. And what's interesting to realize here is how a small change in RPM has a pretty dramatic impact on your CFM when you're following a line of constant static pressure. So this particular curve I have is 12,000 CFM. And from the fan laws on a normal system, if I take 12,000 CFM and I want to go to 6,000 CFM, I just simply slow my fan down 50%, 60 hertz to 30 hertz. My RPM will cut in half, you know, my, my horsepower will be a, or my, my pressure will be a quarter, my horse, horsepower will be an eighth, just following the fan laws. But with a system where we have constant static pressure that we're maintaining, again, we're not moving this direction anymore, we're moving right or left. So as I slow this fan down from 1438 to 1284, to in this case down to around 1130, I've only slowed down, you know, roughly um, 300 RPM, but I'm back down, I'm actually below my 6,000 CFM level that I was looking for. So that's roughly a 20% decrease in the RPM. That's all it really took. Going from basically 60 Hertz to roughly 47 Hertz takes care of business. So what I find with a lot of these systems, it's a very small RPM band that you end up working in versus a pretty significant band that you would be working with within on a normal, um, you know, system where you're not trying to maintain constant static pressure. Keep that in mind because that influences your ability to stay in a stable up portion of the fan curve versus going into this, you know, hatched area over here, which is a trouble area. We want to stay out of the do not select care area because that's a stall situation. So, so I'll show you an example. Here is a 12,000 CFM operation. You can see my fan operate is at 1494. Here's 12,000 CFM. I happen to have 4,000 feet of um, feet per minute of outlet velocity. This is just randomly picked. And I'm okay with going down to 3,000 feet per minute, which means that I can safely take my fan and use a variable frequency drive to slow it down to 9,000 CFM. I'm not changing anything. My velocity though is decreasing. My fan RPM is decreasing. I'm still maintaining the pressure I need, you know, you know, right in this case, roughly one and a half inches. Um, and there's no issues here. I can work back and forth in that band. As long as I don't go below 9,000 or, or basically 9,000 CFM on the fan, I'm not gonna have a velocity problem either and a plume problem. If I need more air though, or more control or less pressure in the duct system, I can open up that bypass damper and I can start to take more outside air, leaving the fan at constant flow. And now I can drop down to 6,000 CFM or, or less and just handle that all through the bypass damper. So in this situation, I'm pretty far down the fan curve, pretty low pressure. As long as I know my minimum velocity, CFM, I can pretty much assure what RPM that is and I'm not going to have a plume problem. Now, I selected another fan curve where I'm much, much higher up the knee of the curve. Now, a good thing about being higher on the knee of the curve is your efficiency is going to go up. So this would actually probably use less energy than the previous because it's just a more efficient part of the fan curve. But there's other inherent challenges. So now I have again 12,000 CFM, that's my operating point, and I plugged it in just to, at six inches of water gauge. So pretty high pressure in this particular system. With the fan I selected, my normal outlet velocity is 45, 45. And in my particular case, I'm okay with, with bringing this fan down to 3,000 feet per minute nozzle velocity, which correlates to just under 8,000 CFM. So if I'm riding a line of constant static pressure to 8,000 range, notice that before I get to that minimum CFM, I move into the stall area of the fan curve. And this is supposed to be alarming. It's red with exclamation points. That's bad. 
this is you know calls that we get where the fan inexplicably starts to make funny sounds or it vibrates when I'm in a situation where hoods start to close. So you have to be very cognizant of where you are on the fan curve because you can't just simply on every system, I'm gonna slow the fan down with a variable frequency drive because you might just find yourself slipping into the surge area, which causes a lot of other problems. So what you're going to need in this case is say, okay, I can't go down to 8,000, you know, maybe 9,000, 10,000 is my minute limit in terms of velocity. Then I'm gonna use bypass to take care of the rest so that we don't go into a stall situation. From here now, an understanding how we're moving across in terms of constant static pressure, we can dive a little bit more into something even more interesting, which is sequencing of fans. That's the ability to turn on more fans or less fans based on the demand required in the building. And this is very common on our bigger laboratory systems. It's also good to use when you're working on a lab that might have multiple phases of startup. So maybe year one, you're only 50% capacity, then it goes to 75% capacity, and then over time, 100. It allows a means to allow this system to grow as the lab grows or becomes more utilized. So a quick example, N plus one, three fans, two operating, one on standby. My standby has an isolation damper that is closed. Full capacity, I need 10,000 out of the lab, my fans add up to 10,000, which means I, I need no bypass there. Everything's balanced off here. So I start to close sashes. Okay, so what can we do? One thing we could do is actually slow the fans down with a variable frequency drive as we just suggested. But in my example, I'm locked in at this velocity. I need the velocity for whatever reason. I'm going to do this all with bypass. So I only need 75% of the capacity of the lab. I'm gonna bring my other 25% from the bypass. Perfect, everything balances off. 10,000 coming into the fans, 10,000 exhausting. Now I'm at 50-50, so more hoods are shut down. Less, less research, less need for air inside of the space. So everything's balanced, I have 10,000 into the equipment and 10,000 exhausting. So when you get to this point, you start to think, okay, if for example, I drop down, I only need 4,500 from the lab, I can certainly bypass 5,500 CFM or even more. Maybe I need 3,000 from the lab. Why not let's let you 7,000? I can leave the number of fans static here because I'm, everything balances off. But when you get to that point where you start to get below the capacity of an individual fan, you start to think about staging one of them off. So in this case, 4,500, instead of bypassing 5,500, I shut off an exhaust fan now I only need to bypass 500 CFM. Now that cut my sound power in half because I have one fan versus two. It cut my brake horsepower in half because I'm using one fan versus two. So it makes a lot of sense. And as you go lower and lower, you can add more bypass there to balance off for those you know, nights and weekend situations where your lab isn't being utilized fully. Great thing to do. Now, as a word of caution, what you want to do when you shut off you know, fan two or three, depending which happens to be running, make sure that you shut off the fan and close the damper at the same time or close the isolation damper first and then shut off the, that, that particular fan. What we don't wanna do is you know, basically shut off the fan with the damper open because it'll start to spin backwards, which can be a problem with your particular systems. And that's more of a problem at startup. So let's say uh, more sashes start to open and I wanna kick fan two back on. If you open the isolation damper first, air is going to go backwards through that idle fan and it's gonna spin 100 miles an hour in reverse and then power is going to come to it and that can cause some mechanical challenges to motors and drives and bearings and such. Plus you're not getting the appropriate containment you need from the lab. So my recommendation is turn the fan on, open that damper at the same time, or start the fan first and then open that isolation damper. It's very important to do so you don't have oddball mechanical issues with your system. All of that is really hinged on having good quality isolation dampers. You know, I recommend heavy duty control dampers for your large lab systems, things that can handle high pressure. I'm showing eight inches of water gauge or more that will have no pressure problem with your four to six inches of duct static pressure. They can handle higher velocities as well. Uh, too many times I see 
alternative suppliers that are using extruded aluminum blades that deflect, deform, they leak, and then you have a lot of um, issues up at the fan level versus pulling air from the space, which is generally what we want to do. We do not want to have short circuiting up on top of the building. And this could all be part of your basic spec and make sure you get quality product for your particular facilities. Now, as we wrap up, we have I have some content regarding to what I'm seeing in terms of the industry direction. Uh, as I had mentioned, life safety is obviously extremely important. That's what this is, a life safety application. But what we're, do, what we're trying to find is new ways to keep it safe but reduce energy. So I have a handful of things that are you know, happening throughout the laboratory market. Um, first one, 3,000 feet per minute going away. You know, rec If you recall, I had a, a slide up front that said, my stack height needs to be 10 feet, my nozzle velocity needs to be 3,000 feet per minute. Well, that's been a common practice for years and years to say 3,000 feet per minute. But the reality is nobody is really sure if that's the right answer or not. It's a really good rule of thumb, and I would always stick to that unless you go talk to a wind weight consult and they might say, hey, in your situation, you need 4,000 feet per minute. Or maybe you only need 2,000 feet per minute, and then you're allowed to slow everything down and reduce the cost of operation. So that's a big change. And if you look at ANSI Z9.5, that's being written out in terms of 3,000 feet per minute. Um, that, that's not really, it's a guideline, but what ASHRAE, ANSI, what they're really looking at us to do now is to take a look, hire a wind weight consultant, especially on the big labs, to validate if you have a safe nozzle velocity. Conversion to variable air volume systems, especially for you know heavy hood intensive labs, makes sense. And if you recall my saying, red arrows out and blue arrows in, if, you, if there's less red arrows going out, I can have less blue in, which means I'm reducing the cost of operation, which is a good thing. Avoiding excess bypass error is a good thing to do as well. And that comes down to using a variable frequency drive, as I'm showing in the second or fourth bullet, or staging fans on or off. I mean, obviously, if we can make sure the fan is slowing down, it's gonna reduce energy. If there's less fans operating, that can save energy as well, versus just sucking in tons of bypass air. We'll talk about energy recovery second, and then wind speed, wind direction, and wind concentration modeling, or excuse me, monitoring as we wrap up this presentation, what's happening there. So on the energy recovery side, numerous ways to collect energy, in our case, from the exhaust and apply it to the supply. But, but being a lab, we have contaminants. So very rare, although I've seen it used in some cases, we're using an enthalpy wheel. Sometimes I see cores, sometimes I see heat pipes. Heat pipes don't really bother me. I think it's a good idea because you can separate your exhaust from your supply. That becomes very tricky with an enthalpy wheel. And if you have some type of plate heat exchanger, you know, you have more opportunity to prevent cross-contamination. But, you know, an enthalpy wheel in cross-contamination problems is, you know, not very recommended. Most of the time what I'm seeing on labs are run around coil loop systems where we're plugging a coil in the exhaust side of the system and then a marrying coil on the supply side. So if you're on markets like New England, the mid upper Midwest where you have big swings in Delta T, uh, take Wisconsin in January, it's 20 below outside, 70 degree air exhausting our lab. Let's utilize a little of that 70 degree air to preheat the air coming in. It's a good thing. It's, it's it's sensible only, so we're not handling humidity and other challenges, but we're taking a bit of the chill out of the air. Or conversely, if it's very warm, we're taking a little bit of the heat out of the air. And there are multiple solutions. You know, there are pre-engineered packages where you can just go select the box and tie it to your bypass plenum. You know, they're you know kind of plug and play solutions. And Buckley also has custom air handling solutions as well, where they can plug our product along with a box that's tuned specifically to your application, whether it's inline tubular fans or the industrial blower styles. You have weird space constraints, high volume, um, you know, working with Buckley and their manufacturers have worked very closely over the years to make sure that everything works as intended when it's all installed on top of your facility. So good way to go, uh, whether you want pre-engineered plug and play or you want to go the custom approach. Now, wind speed and wind direction. This is pretty interesting. We've seen this pretty happening more and more on the West Coast, but I'm hearing more and more about it as it comes across the US. So 
using that same ASHRAE lab design guide diagram in the upper right corner, you know, in this case, we're really starting to look at wind speed, wind direction, and what's what's downstream of our stack. So in the case of the diagram, I have air intakes A and B, I potentially have other buildings, you know, to the right of this this diagram. And quite frankly, we're very concerned about that effluent. So we want to keep that velocity up and above so it doesn't come the plume doesn't come back into our space. What if the wind does a 180 and comes from right to left? and there's nothing out there, there are no air intakes, there are no neighbors, you might start to say, you know what, in those situations, I'm comfortable reducing the nozzle velocity and just letting the plume go down because there's no detrimental impact to anything off to the left. So doing this requires a wind weight consultant and I have a little wind uh, rows below, you can see in, in this particular facility, a lot of northwest winds you know, five to 6% calm days. So most of the time we're dealing with some type of wind out of the Northwest. If there's things to the you know, Southeast, you need to be cognizant of it. If there isn't, it allows you to um, loosen up on your requirements for nozzle velocity. So that's happening as we speak. Chemical sensing and concentration monitoring happening more and more as well. So in addition to monitoring the wind, now you're seeing systems that are monitoring what's happening in the lab space. So if if I spill something and there's a high concentration of chemicals, okay, we need to ramp up the system. We need higher air changes to ensure it's, you know, we're not allowing uh, fumes to escape to another part of the building. Or that monitoring can be in the stack. You know, I'd mentioned a common question is, hey, what's the concentration? It really depends on the lab, the usage, if there's clean air being, you know, brought in through adjacent hoods, so on and so forth. But as concentration gets high, the wind's blowing the right direction, our building management system can take all of these factors and say, okay, we really need to ramp this up. Maybe you have a lab nights and weekends where it's very clean air and not a problem. We can be monitoring what's coming through that duct system and slow everything down. You know, that's an option as well. So again, I, I, I see this happening more and more, more sensors, more intelligence requires people on that facility to have a clue what's going on to make sure sensors are working and so on and so forth. But again, a good way to save energy, and I suspect the technology is going to get better and better. For the most part, I see this aftermarket. You know, the, the lab's been running for a few years, and an energy consultant comes in and says, hey, you know, try some of these. It can help you reduce cost of operation. We'll see if it starts to come back in on the new construction side at some point, uh, but we'll play that by ear.